the discussions in the first three panels today really set the stage for this final panel entitled the Fed's balance sheet and credit policy. With the Fed's target funds rate so close to the zero bound amid so much uncertainty and temporary downside risk, things we've talked about today, what is the Fed's strategy on the balance sheet? What's its, what's its strategy on credit policy? What should its strategy be? When we go back to late 2018, facing financial crisis in the zero lower bound, the Fed initiated QE1 in November 2008. Fed Chair Bernanke quickly emphasized that it was credit easing, not quantitative easing, reflecting the Fed's purchases of MBS. And he emphasized that the balance sheet would be unwound on a timely basis. Instead, even after the, econ the economy had recovered and was on a self-sustaining growth path, the Fed ramped up its asset purchases with QE2 and QE3. The failure of nominal GDP to growth to accelerate during uh, following these dramatic asset purchases calls into question the stimulative impacts. And uh, more recently, the Fed has um, come around to acknowledge that uh, QE2 and QE3 didn't have the effect that they had advertised that it did earlier. Um, since then, the Fed has settled into a strategy of maintaining ample reserves. We all kind of know what that means. <clears throat> and um, in the recent shift in, in the operating procedures of the Fed beginning last se September to provide um, large liquidity infusions into the short-term funding markets, while not QE, uh, uh, singles, signals to the markets that the Fed will play a dominant role in these markets with the goal of dampening volatility. So I'd like to make just one, one more comment, and that, you know, pers pertinent to the last panel. We're very close to the, the zero lower bound, and we have an extraordinarily large balance sheet, and it was put in place 10 years ago as an emergency. And then, and then the, the balance sheet was expanded more and more, and then, <clears throat> Last um, June at the Fed Strategy Conference, um, as some people, Andy, I think you noted, um, um, Chair Powell said the Fed's greatest challenge is the zero lower bound. And then the Fed subsequently, even though the economy was growing exactly as the Fed had forecast, um, the Fed cut rates three times. And those were, as they said, insurance policy cuts. The economy kept growing. The, the insurance policy cuts against the uncertainty about um, Trump's trade policies, those uncertainties dissipated. The economy kept growing. The Fed didn't take away those insurance policies, just as it didn't unwind the balance sheet, which had been expanded initially on an emergency basis. And so maybe one of the issues we face now is this is, I, I believe this is temporary, this supply and demand shock. It's temporary. We'll get through it. So when the Fed reconsiders um, its, its strategy framework, it should be um, <clears throat> to distinguish between what is an emergency policy versus a, main, a policy that's to be maintained. So in addition <clears throat> to my earlier questions, I wonder, <laughs> can we rely on the Fed's balance sheet strategies to achieve what the, says, what the Fed says they will? And as the Fed's strategies of ample reserves, IOER, and the heavy involvement in short-term funding markets, are they simply too complex for the Fed to achieve? I mean, are they too complex and are they just um, unnecessary in order for the Fed to achieve its dual mandate? 
So with that, I'd like to um, go in alphabetical order. President George, would you like to start? Thank you, Mickey. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate on this panel and to pay tribute to Marvin Goodfriend and his many contributions to the theory and practice of monetary policy. I'm also pleased, Marsha, that you could be here. Marsha, a former Fed colleague uh, of mine, and it was a pleasure to meet you, Miriam, uh, Marvin's sister. At the Kansas City Fed, we knew Marvin as a scholar, and we also knew him as a very good Federal Reserve colleague. Marvin also was a participant in a number of our Jackson Hole Economic Symposiums. As a research officer at the Richmond Fed, he attended the very first symposium that we held in Jackson Hole in 1982, where his work on discount window borrowing, monetary control, and post-October 6, 1979 Federal Reserve operating procedures was widely cited. 34 years later, in 2016, as a professor at Carnegie Mellon, Marvin presented a paper at Jackson Hole making the case for deeply negative interest rates as a policy tool that could breach the zero lower bound on nominal rates. He argued that the zero interest bound encumbrance on monetary policy should be removed so that movements in the intertemporal terms of trade could be reflected fully in interest rate policy to sustain price stability and full employment with a minimum of inefficient and costly alternative policies. Marvin was always willing to challenge conventional views as we've heard from others today. And with this paper, he expressed concern, quote, that central banks would be tempted to rely even more heavily on balance sheet policy in lieu of interest rate policy, in effect exerting stimulus by fiscal policy, the assumption of credit risk and maturity transformation, all taking risk on behalf of taxpayers and all moving central banks ever closer to destructive inflationary finance. Marvin understood the associated heartburn of this view, acknowledging that negative interest rates was an idea that would likely require and I quote, some getting used to. He noted, however, that the public also was initially resistant to leaving the gold standard and later to floating the exchange rate, but gradually accepted these changes. While the use of negative interest rates certainly gives me pause as a way to address a future encounter with the effective lower bound, I share Marvin's concerns about the potential side effects of balance sheet policies that pose risk to financial stability and threaten the central bank's policy independence. In 2013, as a voting member of the FOMC, I expressed my own concerns about the continuation of the asset purchase program known popularly then as QE3. By that time, financial markets had stabilized and the economy was growing. These concerns about the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet under those conditions echoed many of Marvin's concerns. In my view, the possible unintended side effects of the ongoing asset purchases posed risk to economic and financial stability and served to unnecessarily further complicate future monetary policy. Today, however, it's conventional wisdom that the benefits of these asset purchases have been clearly established and that their potential costs have been proven negligible. History and further research may ultimately affirm that wisdom, but it remains less than clear to me that the longer run cost of balance sheet policies have been fully taken into account. As a consequence of large scale asset purchases, for example, the FOMC had to evaluate and reconsider its longstanding operating framework. Given the abundant reserves associated with its balance sheet policies, the FOMC had to consider whether the Fed funds rate target could be achieved administratively by setting the interest rate on excess reserves. Indeed, to ensure effective interest rate control and establish a firm floor on overnight rates, an overnight reverse repo facility was created. In addition, as the Fed began to shrink its balance sheet, it proved challenging to gauge the minimum reserve balances needed for achieving the Fed funds rate target 
without intervention by the open market desk at the New York Fed. As a result, the desk resumed regularly conducting repo operations and outright purchases of treasuries to build a bigger buffer and ensure an ample supply of reserves. These operations have caused some confusion in markets, as some participants have seen them incorrectly, in my view, as a type of quantitative easing. More generally, to the extent that large-scale asset purchases succeeded in their aim of creating a wealth effect, as was often referred to, they also played some role in contributing to elevated asset valuations. <laughs> These effects, together with the perception that interest rates will remain at historically low levels for a prolonged period, can lead to a buildup of financial imbalances that ultimately pose risk to the real economy. Experience has shown that these imbalances can develop in sectors outside the lens of regulators and as witnessed a decade ago, can unwind with little warning. Another concern I shared with Marvin is the risk that income from the Fed's large balance sheet combined with our capital surplus could tempt fiscal authorities to view the Fed as a source of funding for government programs. I would argue that we've seen a degree of this risk unfold. The funding of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as required under the Dodd-Frank Act, is a case in point. Each quarter, the Reserve Bank's transfer to the Bureau, without congressional appropriations, the amount of funds requested by the director of the Bureau to carry out its operations. To date, the Fed has transferred more than $4 billion to the Bureau. In addition, the Dodd-Frank Act required the Fed to fund the first two years of the Office of Financial Research in support of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Yet another example of congressional funding of programs outside the regular appropriations process was funding highway construction, known as the FAST Act, Fixing America's Surface Transportation. In that act, Congress funded highway construction by reducing the Federal Reserve Bank's stock dividend rate for member banks with assets of more than $10 billion. The act also placed a cap of $10 billion on the aggregate surplus of the Federal Reserve Banks and directed that any excess be transferred to the Treasury General Fund. The potential policy implications of modifying dividends to member banks are more generally the nature of the requirement for member banks to purchase stock in a Federal Reserve is a concerning development that risks undermining the Federal Reserve's longstanding institutional design of public and private interests serving the American public. To ensure the central bank maintains surplus capital against prospective exposures on a balance sheet inflated by large-scale asset purchases, Marvin argued that the central bank must have independent authority to retain its net interest earnings to build surplus capital. Without such capital, the carry trade, as he called it, exposure from the balance sheet, would jeopardize the operational credibility of monetary policy for price stability. Finally, Marvin was adamant that central bank independence was essential for the credibility and effectiveness of monetary policy. In testimony before Congress, Marvin said, flexibility and decisiveness are essential for effective central banking. Independence enables a central bank to react promptly to macroeconomic or financial shocks without the approval of the Treasury or legislature. Central bank initiatives must be regarded as legitimate by the legislature and the public, otherwise such initiatives will lack credibility essential for their effectiveness. Furthermore, to maintain independence, policymakers must draw a bright line, Marvin said, between monetary and fiscal policy actions. I quote, the problem is to identify the limits of independence on monetary policy and credit policy to preserve a workable and sustainable division of responsibilities between the central bank and the fiscal authorities. Arguably, this bright line faded in November of 2008 when the Federal Reserve announced its first round of large-scale asset purchases consisting of agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities. This program significantly expanded in March 2009 and additional open-ended purchases of MBS were announced under the third round of LSAPs in September of 2012. Today, the Federal Reserve continues to hold mortgage-backed securities on its balance sheet, and the FOMC has indicated 
that it doesn't anticipate selling these assets as part of its policy normalization process. These holdings could be viewed arguably as blurring the line between monetary policy and credit allocation. To address this important distinction, Marvin proposed that the 1951 Treasury Federal Reserve Accord on Monetary Policy be supplemented with a Treasury Fed Accord on credit policy. And here he identified three key principles. First, as a long run matter, a significant sustained departure from a Treasury's only asset acquisition policy is incompatible with Fed independence. Second, the Fed should adhere to Treasury's only except for occasional, temporary, well collateralized, ordinary last resort lending to solvent supervised banks. And third, Fed credit initiatives beyond ordinary last resort lending should be undertaken only with prior agreement of the fiscal authorities and only as bridge loans accompanied by takeouts arranged and guaranteed in advance by fiscal authorities. These principles, I think, are worth considering as the Federal Reserve contemplates its next encounter with the zero lower bound. Our ongoing review of our monetary policy strategy, tools, and communications necessarily have surfaced a number of possible approaches to address such a future encounter. Among the possibilities are things we've tried in the past, such as asset purchases and forward guidance. Other ideas have been more novel, such as average inflation targeting, yield curve control, and yes, even negative interest rates. Marvin may be right, that these things, particularly when they are controversial, take some getting used to. But as importantly, he was keenly focused on preserving the central bank's integrity and independence at the same time. That perspective undoubtedly will serve us well today. Thank you, Mickey. Well, I didn't have the privilege of knowing Marvin nearly as well as almost all the speakers who have spoken before me today. Um, I think I first met him at a Carnegie Rochester conference, and I had the occasion to have some pretty intense discussions with him at that conference and several that followed. Um, those few intense conversations were enough for me to feel the kind of intellectual magnetism and personal warmth that so many people have spoken about today. So for those of you who didn't get to know him, that became apparent very quickly. After that, I probably didn't hear from him maybe for a decade, um, but he contacted me a few years ago with the invitation to join the Shadow Open Market Committee. I was pleased, but I demurred. My long interest has been in increasing the transparency of federal financial policy, and certainly that broad interest was in line with the SOMC, uh, but I hadn't really concentrated on the monetary policy aspect of that, maybe because that's one of the biggest challenges in transparency and monetary policy. Um, in any case, I guess I got a taste of his iron will, which I didn't um, really know about until I heard about it today. Um, but he convinced me to come on to the SOMC, which has turned out to be a great decision. Um, but I think what really clinched the deal was the opportunity that I anticipated to have him as a close colleague to try to work through some really complicated fundamental issues and to draw on his very flexible intellect and ability to analyze questions, not necessarily within a formal model, but with a huge amount of rigor. So, um, so I guess what I want to talk about today is like a continuation of the conversation that I had hoped that I would have with him over the course of these meetings over many years. And that's to address the question of whether open market operations and Fed balance sheet expansions have a fiscal element and in particular, are they less fiscal when the transactions involve treasury securities rather than private securities? I think the conventional view and Marvin's view is that in fact using government securities is often close to fiscally neutral and the same trades in private securities wouldn't be. 
Um, personally, I disagree with that. And um, particularly, I think that it's hard to make that argument when the Federal Reserve is paying interest on reserves. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is that aspect of non-neutrality um, and, and also touch a little bit on whether there is really a first order difference in terms of fiscal policy between transactions in treasuries and transactions in private securities. It's very late in the day to suggest that you open up the handout that I had um, in your folders, and if you don't, that's fine. Um, but if for me, um, thinking through these transactions is probably clearest by thinking about working through the balance sheets of the Fed, of the rest of the government, consolidating the two, and then also thinking what's happening on the bank and household side. Um, so, the, so what I want to start with is um, to try to encapsulate why I think economists like Marvin would argue that transacting in treasuries is just a matter of maturity transformation in government liabilities, um, but doesn't have any fiscal effects. Um, so you could imagine that the Federal Reserve decides it's going to put more treasuries on the balance sheet, and it finances that with an increase in reserves. So it has an equal increase in its assets and liabilities. Those Federal Reserve actions have no effect necessarily on the rest of, rest of government. Um, but when you consolidate the Federal Reserve balance sheet with the rest of government, what you see is that effectively issuing reserves and buying treasuries could be described as simply a liability swap. What does that liability swap do? Well, not much in the sense that the government is still on the hook for the same amount of liabilities. There hasn't been a change in the size of the overall um, balance sheet. Now, if those reserves are used to buy long-term treasury securities, that does change the average maturity of the treasury debt. Um, does that matter? Well, I think. Marvin and others feel that a more neutral thing to do is for the Federal Reserve to transact in short-term treasuries, and then you haven't created a change in the maturity structure of the debt. Um, but I don't even know that that matters so much, because after all, the Treasury has the power to undo anything the Fed does in terms of that switch in maturity structure. And in fact, if you look at the average maturity of the Treasury debt since the financial crisis, it's increased considerably. And so that suggests that the Fed has been offsetting a lot of that, um, that change. OK, so um, we have what's essentially a liability swap um, in terms of the balance sheet of banks and the public. Um, the public is holding fewer treasuries and more reserves, um, and that's all that really happens. Um, now, let me just quickly go through the same set of transactions um, when, instead of buying treasuries, the purchases are purchases of private securities financed by the issuance of reserves. In terms of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, it doesn't look like a big change. Reserves increase by the same amount, and instead of holding more treasuries, they hold more private bonds. Again, the rest of the government has no change in their balance sheet. When you go to the consolidated government balance sheet, it is larger by the amount of those private bonds, and there hasn't been a liability swap. Um, coming down to the banks and the public balance sheet, what I want to emphasize here is that just as in the case of purchasing treasury securities, there's no change in the liabilities of the public in terms of future taxes or absorbing changes in other government services. What I'm going to conclude from all of that is that whether the Fed buys treasuries or whether they buy private securities, as long as those transactions take place at market prices, it's a zero NPV transaction. And so in the sense of not changing the present value of tax liabilities or other spending, 
in some essential way, it's not fiscal. Okay. Um, but now let me turn to well, what's actually happening is that um, fiscal neutrality of these transactions has been broken, not by the purchase of private securities, and by the way, not in my view by the purchase of agency securities. We can differ about that. At the point they were buying a lot of agency securities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had been um, put into conservatorship by the government, so essentially their securities were government securities. So I think that's also um, less the issue, but what was the issue is that there was a massive policy shift when the Fed started paying interest on reserves. Okay, so that interest on reserves has shades of what used to happen at the discount window, but that was a very small amount of lending at an administrative rate, and now there's an enormous amount um, of borrowing by the Fed at an administrative rate. And so, um, as has been discussed, post-crisis, there's been an acceptance that the Fed would ma maintain a much larger balance sheet indefinitely. And that's actually been made possible by this policy of paying interest on reserves. Um, so I would argue that potentially this has a very large fiscal effect because what I called a liability swap before of one type of liability for another with treasury securities is no longer a zero NPV swap. You're now paying more on these reserves and that is a fiscal cost. Um, so, uh, sorry. Okay, so um, it seems reasonable to ask, well, um, what's, what's a good approximation of what that cost has been? Is it significant enough to give one pause um, about the amount of fiscal policy involved with Federal Reserve transactions. I'm going to give you some numbers, which I think will give at least some of you pause. Um, so in doing this calculation, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can look at the amount of reserves that um, the Fed has on its balance sheets, and you can ask how much more is the government paying than they would have had they used Treasury securities to finance the debt, okay? Um, well, I did this calculation using two benchmarks that seemed plausible, the three-month T-bill rate and the overnight T-bill rate. Um, over this period, because the yields were low and the yield curve wasn't very steep, it didn't make that much difference. Um, but if you looked at the interest on excess reserves versus the three-month T-bill rate, the average difference was 15 basis points over the period that I looked at that ran from um, October of 2008 through um, October of 2019. Um, in terms of the one-day T-bill rate, it was about 19 basis point. Well, if you do the simple math of multiplying the amount of reserves by that excess payment, you get a cost of between 30 and 40 billion dollars that um, is an increase in the liabilities of taxpayers in the future, um, which I hope you all agree is an essentially fiscal kind of action. So that's, that's fairly significant. And as with all fiscal policies, um, we care about the tax cost and we also care about the incidence of the benefits. In the case of um, paying an above market interest rate on reserves, um, clearly it appears that the direct beneficiaries is the banking system. In fact, we know that the banking system was able to borrow at the Fed funds rate. A lot of institutions that didn't have direct access to the Fed balance sheet nevertheless could try to get a little bit of that premium rate by depositing their money in banks. Um, so if you look at the difference between um, the Fed funds rates and what the banks were um, receiving from the Fed, you get a calculation um, that suggests the transfer to the banking system was about 21 million, 21 billion, not million, dollars. Um, so again, a pretty significant number and one um, which I believe um, is fiscal and I, I think the fact that this calculation is so easy and I haven't seen anyone else do it is kind of testimony 
to the sad power of accounting conventions to hide the true cost of um, fiscal actions that aren't very simple, like writing a check for Social Security. So, um, so anyway, I wanted. Um, so that's basically when I wanted to say, which is I, I do believe there is a very large fiscal element to monetary policy. I actually think that in discussing this with Marvin and others, there's some basic disagreements about what fiscal policy even really means and where the line is between what we call fiscal policy and credit policy. Just to circle back to one other point I wanted to make when we were talking about the private securities um, in terms of what's neutral in terms of credit policy, I never understood the argument of Marvin and others that treasury purchases were somehow neutral and buying private securities made it less neutral because it, from my perspective, the neutral thing to do is to buy as broadly as you can in the market to avoid distorting the relative prices between different kinds of securities. The policy of only buying treasury securities to the extent there's some clientele effects is to reduce the cost of borrowing for the government relative to the rest of the market. Is that neutral? Is that, credit, is that neutral credit policy? In my book, probably not. In any case, I'm very grateful to Marvin to have brought me into this very interesting group. And um, I'm very sad that he's not here now to continue these conversations. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's see how long this lasts. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I, I stood up because I got a cramp in my leg, and uh, that's why I stood up. Uh, and I apologize for standing up and interrupting your presentation. Uh, maybe you didn't even notice. I didn't. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> but they did. Well, it, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here with, with so many uh, long-time friends. Uh, and, but note carefully, I'm not saying old friends, just long-time friends. This is a wireless. Uh, to honor the, uh, the, the memory and contributions of Marvin, good friend. He was a student of mine at Brown, at Brown University, and over the years we kept up our relationship. In 1984, I was able to bring him to the Council of Economic Advisors for a year as a senior staff economist. Now, in my paper, I discussed two of his papers. Uh, one, a fine and lasting contribution, uh, the one on, on um, from the Merrill case, the secrecy, and then the other that I'm going to concentrate on, unencumbering interest rate policy. Now, I'm not so happy with that paper, and it would have been fun to have, have it out with him, I guess is the way we going to say it. But I'm going to tell you why I'm not happy with that paper. So is it now working? Are you able to hold this with this? Oh, you want me to hold it? OK. <laughs> you want me to do two things? OK. Um, so Mar Marvin's paper w was not a success in, in my view, the unencumbering paper. It was technically interesting in some respects but was fundamentally off base. And I think that Marvin would have enjoyed this discussion. It was off base because once past the recession trough in 2009, it did not seem to me that the quantitative easing was likely to be effective. And it did, not, and it did run some risks. Uh, and I agree with uh, Esther George, what she said about that, and Charlie Fawcett's paper uh, last year at this meeting. But I want to emphasize evidence matters. Evidence matters. Now suppose you had administered a two-part questionnaire in 1960 about the Great Depression to an audience like this one, where you have a lot of expertise. And the first part of the questionnaire asks you about what you think your views would have been in late 1930, let's say, on what is causing the sharp decline in economic activity. Remember, this is 1960 now. And the second part would ask you about what your policy recommendations would be. 
would, would have been in, in 1930 now. Oh, and now repeat this exercise in 1980 with the exact same questions, exact same questions. The answers would have been dramatically different because the audience would have absorbed the Friedman Schwartz monetary history. In 1960, some of you, I'll say you, might have recommended the ban on interest on checking accounts, for example, and regulation Q ceilings on time and savings. Would that recommendation still have been around in 1980? Uh, now consider a similar questionnaire on the financial crisis, the recent one. And you, one part of it is uh, administered in June 2009. That turned out to be the cycle trough. And we're going to have identical questions in June of 2019. So the part one questions include some on the causes of the crisis. But let me assume that before the 2019 questionnaire, you have been instructed to read four books, all of which appeared after 2009. One is Bethany McLean, All the Devils Are Here. These people have co-authors, all of them, except for one. The second is Gretchen Morganson, Reckless Endangerment. You can probably guess what the other two are, um, which, which appeared in 2011. The third is uh, Charlie Calamar's book, Fragile by Design, uh, which appeared in 2014. And a fourth is Peter Wallison's book, Hidden in Plain Sight, which appeared in 2015. Now, if you're an advocate of the speculative bubble, Wall Street did it theory, I'll wager that after reading these books, that your views are going to be different. Your answers to a 2019 survey will differ from those that you would have given in a 2009 survey. So my objection to Marvin's unencumbering paper is that he offers a policy prescription without a clear statement of why the recovery was so slow after the cycle peak. Now, I, I believe that the slow recovery after 2009 had nothing to do with monetary policy and couldn't have been fixed with, by monetary policy. The basic problem, I believe, was that uh, a slow recovery of business fixed investment, and you can look in the national income accounts and confirm that it was slower than a typical recovery. Interest rates were very low providing a great opportunity to accelerate business investment. Why did that not happen? It didn't happen. So in December of 2013, the FOMC staff prepared, uh, projected GDP growth rates for 2014, 15, and 16 of 3.1%, 3.5, and 3.4, respectively. One year later, in December 2014, the projections for these years were 2.2%, 2.5, and 2.7, respectively. A very significant downshift in the outlook. A major reason for the downshift was the failure of business fixed investment to respond to historically low interest rates. Now, I believe that a great deal of what's going on here is regulatory burden. And to understand why an investment boom did not occur, at least in part, sp spend 10 minutes on two documents when you get home uh, relating to the redevelopment of the abandoned Bethlehem Steelworks facility in Sparrows Point, Maryland. At one point, this was the largest steel production facility in the world. The first skimmed the 269-page document 
and the title of this document is Settlement Agreement and Covenant Not to Sue Sparrows Point Terminal LLC. So what, what's happened a lot with our uh, environmental cleanup is that the EPA wants to sue people to collect when the people uh, when the company that created the problem is bankrupt and gone, then it just sits there. And nobody can buy it because they're going to be sued. Um, and then a second uh, EPA document to look at that's quite interesting, public informational meeting on the former Sparrows Point Steel Mill environmental cleanup, and it's dated October 3rd, 2019, so it's quite recent. Now, the first document will provide a taste of the legal complexity of restoring contaminated industrial sites, and the second, a taste of the technical complexity of doing so. Now, this project could have proceeded much more quickly if the EPA had a larger staff of inspectors and of officials who could approve each stage of the remediation process. But the EPA has no commercial incentive whatsoever to seeing the project proceed quickly. Its interest is in avoiding possible political embarrassment from making a mistake of some sort, or what some may deem mistakes. So monetary policy can't fix this problem, just can't. And adding new wrinkles to monetary policy, such as negative interest rates, won't fix it either. Now think about the regulatory apparatus in effect today. The entire set of regulations, procedures, court interpretations, and the like. Suppose this entire apparatus had been put into effect all at once 50 years ago, 1970, all at once. Wouldn't macroeconomists have been talking of a gigantic supply shock? I'm quite sure we would have. And perhaps only an old man can feel the difference between 1970 and 2020. <laughs> I studied macroeconomics at Chicago under Martin J. Bailey. His textbook, National Income and the Price Level, continues to occupy a spot close on my bookshelf to my computer where I can reach it. Bailey argued that the secular stagnation thesis coming out of the Great Depression could not possibly be correct. He argued and offered calculations in the appendix that there are some investments available that have an indefinite or infinite or very long life. And the best example was uh, perhaps uh, land creation. So for example, if this Bethlehem Steel facility can be put back into operation, you're recreating land that has value. And it lasts forever. It lasts forever. If you take uh, Holland as an example, there are some upkeeps to the land that they've created. Uh, the dikes have to be maintained, pumping stations, and the like. But as long as these costs are met, the land lasts indefinitely. And I think Holland's been at this for hundreds and hundreds of years. So each year, the return of the land, net of operating costs, is positive. The indefinitely long stream of future returns has a present value that becomes larger and larger as the real rate of interest approaches zero. Thus, the present value will exceed any, and I want to emphasize any, finite cost of construction at a low enough rate of interest. Real rate of interest, of course. And at a zero real rate, using language that mathematicians hate, the present value of a project with positive annual returns and an indefinite life is infinite. There can be little doubt that the real rate of interest applying to business investment is very low and perhaps zero 
in many European countries today. So why have we not seen a boom in construction of long-lived investments, such as pipelines, long-distance electrical transmission towers, flood control dams, pump storage hydroelectric facilities, high-rise office and residential buildings. In fact, there's one just about the, a 76-story building that's going to go up on Fifth Avenue, uh, just close by where we are right today. Don't forget that the Empire State Building opened in 1933. That's almost a century ago and still seems to be an iconic address. You, my, he, he, he's trying to make me be quiet, but I do want, <laughs> but I do want to emphasize before, before I stop, because you have the rest of the paper, but I want to emphasize Keynes's mistake. Now, Keynes made the original mistake in thinking here. After discussing pyramid building and other wasteful ways of creating employment, he says this, and this is a quote. If I am right in supposing it to be comparatively easy to make capital goods so abundant that the marginal efficiency of capital is zero, this may be the most sensible way of gradually getting rid of many of the objectionable features of capitalism. For a little reflection will show what enormous social changes would result from a gradual disappearance of a rate of return on accumulated wealth. Well, Mr. Keynes, it is not comparatively easy. It's impossible. A basic principle taught in beginning economics is that needs, wants, desires are unbounded, whereas resources are always bounded. They're scarce. And that's the basic principle that we're all taught. So I believe uh, you can go to finish the rest of my paper uh, if you have the stomach to do so. But the issue here for investment is why aren't the investment opportunities being seized? It's not a matter of monetary policy pushing interest rates lower. It's a matter of the expertise in the staff of the Federal Reserve explaining why investment is not responding. That's the opportunity. The opportunity is not to push interest rates even lower. OK, one minute over with a little help. <laughs> I'd like to thank our panelists very much. And now we're going to take questions. And, and um, Bill and I have compared notes. Um, my uh, graduate school professor was also Martin Bailey. Questions? Yes, Greg. Here's a microphone. I'm not exactly sure who to address this question to because I've learned something from all of you. Uh, from Deborah, I just learned I didn't know how much the profitability was to banks from the difference between Fed Funds Effective and IOER. And Esther, as a voting member, you will obviously be involved in a bunch of discussions about how to provide liquidity to the economy. And from Bill, um, I learned that investment hasn't picked up. So it suddenly occurred to me, listening to all three of you, that as we approach the zero lower bound, and today's been, there's been a lot of discussion about that, wouldn't there be a good reason to drop the interest on IOER, maybe even to negative, to provide a new source of capital to lending which has obviously become more constrained in recent days. And from what I understand today, IG credit spreads had a really bad day. And it widened about 40 basis points in the last three weeks, kind of sort of offsetting the 50 basis point ease we saw this week. So financial conditions are probably actually tightening again. That why wouldn't we take IOER interest down where banks are lending money to the Fed on a capital-free basis and now earning this 30 to $40 billion of additional return above Fed funds effective, which kind of sort of has probably gone into bank revenues and has kind of sort of probably gone into stock buybacks along the way, and reallocate capital that way as we approach it, the zero lower bound. 
Well, no, I'll respond, I guess, uh, right away to that. Uh, the quantity of investment that we realize comes from the intersection of the supply and demand curves. And in terms of the demand for investment projects that will be put into place, that's we usually think as being interest sensitive. But you can't get the actual investment in place if it can't get it permitted, for example. If you can't get the permits to build it, then it doesn't help at all to do any of these other things that we might, I don't know whether it'd be fair to call them gimmicky, but they don't work if investment can't respond because you can't get the permits to build. Now, if you want to get a, fa a flavor of what's going on, spend some time, and it's going to take a serious time, maybe oh, two or three days each website. Go to the EPA and start scanning through the various things that are going on on the EPA website. Go to the website for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and look at the projects that the FERC is or is not approving. Go to the website of the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers supervises all the waterway projects, the canals, the dams, and so forth. Go to those websites and spend some time and look at the applications that have come in to build stuff that's not being done because they can't get the approvals. Now, when I'm saying can't get, obviously some approvals are going through. Remember the holdup on Keystone XL pipeline. It was simply blocked. President Obama wouldn't approve it coming across the Canadian border. Uh, President Trump did approve it, and it, I don't know where its building going is right now. There have been problems like this in getting approvals. If you want another example, go to the FERC website and do a search and come up with the Coos Bay, Oregon export terminal. This was an export terminal that was originally built to import natural gas from abroad at a time that the US thought that it was running out of natural gas. At, with fracking, it turns out we have a surplus of natural gas. And I think it was a Canadian company that had the great idea, oh, let's turn this export terminal, let's turn this into an export terminal rather than import terminal. And they got all the permits to put the pipelines to bring the natural gas to the Coos Bay terminal. It was all approved and then there was uh, ongoing opposition from the Sierra Club, and a year after getting all of the environmental permits, which is no mean task, you look at these websites, there's no mean task to get all these permits. So a year after getting all those permits, FERC said, not in the national interest, can't do it. Okay, De so, Debbie? Um, okay, so more directly, so I guess there is a question of what to take away from that fiscal effect and whether that's money available to repurpose now to create some stimulus. So what I, what I think is that, what I really wanted you to take away from my numbers is that as Esther said, what the Fed is buying with all those reserves is actually a lot more liquidity in the banking system. And I guess it has felt pretty cheap to buy that liquidity and it can be a useful thing, but the question is how much do you wanna pay for that? I think, um, though any sudden experiment with making a rapid change in anything, this you know that's not clear. That's what you want to do. If you wanted to use federal credit policy to selectively create stimulus, I think the federal government has institutions that are designed to do that and to try to do it in a kind of a random infusion of capital to the banks would be an odd way to do it. So for instance, FEMA has emergency lending authority. The SBA could step up, I think, on their, some of their existing budget authority, what they're doing. Um, it turned out that even during the financial crisis, the student loan program was one of the largest sources of credit for families. So I mean, I think the government can do a lot through, the US government has an enormous footprint in the credit markets, and they could probably try to creatively use that. So I think, I mean, so I just want to reemphasize that, you know, I want to, I'm arguing that the liquidity that was created with this policy was quite expensive. And then if you recognize the cost, you can think about the trade-offs, but it's disconnected from the current situation. 
I guess I would also add maybe a more uh, practical feature of IOER, um, which is with the Federal Reserve targeting the Fed funds rate, which is now a thinly traded interbank market, that in order to get effective interest rate control, we had to use IOER um, in addition to uh, the overnight reverse repo facility as a way to uh, ensure effective rate control. And that was particularly important as we were lifting off uh, from zero. So um, again, what, what you do with that going forward um, is another issue, but I think it is serving a, a practical role uh, for how the committee controls interest rates. Yes. Hi, this is a great subject for a panel. Marvin had numerous balance sheet questions in these meetings over the years. Uh, to me, and maybe President George, you can either uh, straighten me out or explain, there seems to be a huge contradiction in Fed policy. On the one hand, you want to raise inflation to 2%, which you haven't done since you had that target. On the other hand, and you want more latitude, more flexibility in your interest rates to cut them for crises like we face now. On the other hand, you have a big balance sheet uh, policy, uh, combined regulatory and uh, monetary. And uh, Ben Bernanke in his AEA talk talked about how uh, QE, the quantity of QE, depressed the 10-year rate by 120 basis points. And statistically, you find that relationship across the yield curve. Now that we're back almost at QE levels, let's call it 100 basis points. So what many people considered a natural rate of a neutral rate of 250 basis points is now 150 because of that depressing effect. Uh, so you're pushing real rates down. Uh, at the same time, you want to boost inflation. Uh, it seems to be a contradiction. Well, I, I don't think it's a contradiction in the sense of uh, the committee has been very focused on thinking about how it achieves its dual mandate. So looking at um, its inflation objective, looking at its full employment objective. And the issue has been through forecasting and other things that uh, the economy has performed well. And as we've seen the unemployment rate fall, um, a lot of things have been have been headwinds to inflation, whether global issues, uh, commodities, and other things that have really made those forecasts um, around what was going to provide uh, the umph to the 2% target uh, be effective. And I think you heard in some of the earlier panels the precision with which uh, you look at that 2%, I think there are many indications. One of the things I look at in that measure, even the Fed's preferred measure is to say, if I separate out the trends I see with services oriented inflation versus goods, they're moving in very different directions. And what does that tell us about uh, the inflation impulse in the economy? So um, they, are, they are more complicated in my view in how we construct monetary policy. I don't know that they're contradictory um, uh, necessarily, but I think it is one of the challenges of how you think about your balance sheet relative to your interest rate policy tool. S Steve, you had a question? Oh, thank you. Mickey, in your opening comments, you pointed out that there has been a kind of, my words, not yours, kind of an interest rate drift well, base drift of sorts in interest rates that have come down because we've seen insurance cuts and we have seen emergency cuts, but they have not been reversed. I wonder if maybe you and maybe the panel can discuss what kinds of scenarios could we anticipate were we to start to reverse the drift of interest rates and the drift in the, in the balance sheet and all the other emergency steps that were put in place that may not be necessary if the economy goes back to its prior to COVID-19 growth path. Panelists? Could, could I comment just briefly on that? Our situation be, before the uh, virus, uh, let's say through the end of last year, we had great performance in terms of employment, no question about that. 
But what has happened is that our economy has been driven by consumption. It's been driven by consumption and there has not been enough investment. My crude calculation says that business fixed investment is running about 25 basis points uh, percentage of GDP below what it should. So when I did these calculations, just in my head now, uh, we had something in the order of two billion of business fixed investment last year, and it should have been five billion. Uh, enormous, enormous discrepancy here. So we're just not putting in place the capital that we need. Now, we know what the problem is with infrastructure in investment. We know that there are two things. We know that there, there's resistance at uh, all levels of government to raising taxes to build infrastructure. But the other thing that could fix the, ish, fix the highway problem quickly would be to end the prohibition of tolls on interstate highways. You would find toll <coughs> authorities being set up to restore, reconstruct interstates, and state after state would do it if you would end that prohibition. Now, that's a prohibition. I mean, it stops the construction. It's the same kind of thing as the permitting by FERC that stopped the Coos Bay project and on and on and on. So we've got these huge disincentives to investment. They have accumulated drip by drip by drip, drip by drip by drip, <coughs> regulation by regulation by regulation. They haven't come all at once from 1950 to today. Now, don't get me wrong, we needed and need EPA. Pollution is an externality that has to be handled at a governmental level. At least it's, it's a practical matter. Uh, so we need some of these regulatory agencies. I don't dispute that, but they have piled on regulations, many of which are, are, are just not very effective and efficient. Now, I think this is also a lot of the story of Japan. Japan invested heavily in infrastructure, but the infrastructure that it chose to invest in was infrastructure that would provide uh, income and jobs to the construction companies that are part of the LDP, Liberal Democratic uh, Party, uh, controlling government. And so they invested in projects that did not have a, a long run return. So they spent a lot of money, uh, built, as I understand it, duplicate railroads and that kind of thing. It didn't really need, provided jobs, but it did not provide economic growth did not provide increase in productivity. Bill, I'm going to interrupt you. Okay? Now, um, Steve, I think yours is a great question. And I think, I think there's been, if we look since the financial crisis, and, and let's, I give the Fed a lot of credit for during the financial crisis being very creative and providing their alternative liquidity facilities and QE1, and it did lift the, uh, end the uh, help to end the financial crisis. But, but since then, um, once the recovery started and once um, it seemed to be, the growth was self-sustaining, we, we notice, or at least I notice, this uh, little by little, um, expansion of the role of monetary policy. And at the same time, uh, expansion of the toolkit. And, and uh, the Fed, I think, is in this position where it, it tries to do too much beyond the scope of policy. Now, this, this morning, I mean, we heard from Charlie Evans, and you know, and 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 we heard from Eric Rosengren about you know, and and John Williams that what's going on now is, um, you know, it's a supply and demand crisis, but it's really a, a health crisis that needs to be addressed by other policy tools. Um, so to your point, I think the Fed has, to a certain extent, boxed itself into its own corner of trying to do too much and having a very unhealthy relationship with markets, 
um, the markets expect the Fed to do too much. And so I'm just hoping, and I, I honestly believe, that the current um, health crisis is a temporary one. And once we come out of it, then I just urge the Fed to you know, reassess the proper roles of monetary policy and somehow put in place a strategy to step away from this clear easing tilt, which has led it to maintain this very large balance sheet and have us very close to the zero bound. Because I think if they, the Fed's perception of normalization, I think, is a little different than my perception of normalized monetary policy. Esther, did you want to comment on that or not? You don't. I'm happy to leave it with that. Oh. I, would just, I would just say, though, the. Um, so your points are well taken. Um, if you think back over the last uh, year or so, though, the downside risk that faced the economy, thinking about the amount of policy space uh, for the Fed, I think, has prompted um, its actions. When you think about, again, the lack of business investment that we might have normally seen at these rates and looking at a consumer that really is pulling the economy forward, I think put some of this in a different perspective to say how much of the risk uh, could fall to uh, consumption in a way that would require the Fed to respond. So thank you. Thank you. Time for one very quick question, one very quick answer. Bob? Well, actually, I just wanted to employ Debbie Lee's calculations, which I thought. Wait, say it again. I, I, I wanted to that. applaud <laughs> Debbie Lucas's. <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> wants me to repeat this yeah, arbitrary number of, number of times. <laughs> I, and I think I, I want to applaud Debbie Lucas's, and, and, I, and I want to link it to two other topics. So the first thing is that during the crisis, the Fed thought about issuing Fed bills, and then that policy option went away when they started to make use of interest on excess reserves. So we could think about a counterfactual using Debbie's calculations of what would have been, what is the net cost of using interest on excess reserves as opposed to Fed bills. The second thing is to link this to uh, the uh, proposal for a narrow bank that has been blocked by the Fed on regulatory grounds. I take it that this spread that we can see in your graph is a measure of the incentives for the creation of a narrow bank as people take money out of mutual funds and put it into reserves. Um, quick, I, quick response. Yeah, I have little, I, I find the whole narrow banking um, issue confusing, so I'm not going to even attempt to speak it, about it on purpose. I mean, I, I understand, you know, the, the Fed has created an arbitrage opportunity for a subset of the market, and it's taking advantage of it. Um, I don't think it caused a lot of disintermediation from mutual funds. I think it's more that entities like Fannie and Freddie, who had money to park, could get a higher rate of interest for it. So um, I'm going to give you a non-answer on that. But you, um, Mickey said we had very little time, so yes. I'm going to um, honor that. <laughs> right. So. Um, we started today, and um, you know, I said it was going to be a very interesting and lively meeting, and I just think it was extraordinary. And I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, Esther had to run to a plane, um, but I want to thank all the panelists on, on this panel and all the panels the entire day for, and it's just, just clear, the effort that, that all the panelists put into preparing their remarks and, and the, their enthusiasm about you know Marvin, his contributions, and the timeliness of all the topics. And it was, it was just great. And, 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 I, and, I, and I also want to thank uh, the Manhattan Institute for, for sponsoring um, the, the Shadow Open Market Committee. And um, um, Bob Hetzel last night said, you know, he said thanks for sponsoring events like this because it really gets a lot of interesting issues on the table that need to be talked about. And so um, 
Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming despite angst of, of travel and everything. And all these uh, papers and proceeds will be posted on our website, www.shadowfed.org. And within a couple days, give us a week, um, uh, a live uh, a video stream will also uh, be posted. So we thank Princeton Club. We, we, we paid them to rent the space. <laughs> well, I would thank the Princeton Club. I think they did a great job. They did a great job. Thank you, Mickey. And I, and I already did thank very much um, the, the Manhattan Institute um, uh, events and communications group that, that, that really put this together. Thank you.